Good evening, friends. Welcome to Spirit of Life Ministries. I'm Pastor Helen. And tonight we're going to be sharing our Bible study out of Acts. It's a wonderful study to find out what it was like to be in the early church. And, and it's an example for what we're supposed to be doing today. That's the best part about it. We're down in Sebring, Florida. We're praying here for rain. It's like we've been praying for people up in Tennessee to get rain. And those of you that are with us tonight that have been going through some rough times, we hold you up in prayer and want you to know that you're not alone, that God's with you, and that he'll see you through the hard times, just like he's seen us through every other hard time that we've gone through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's open with a world of prayer. Father, we just come to you tonight, and we praise and thank you for being our God and our friend. We love you, Lord. We need you in our life, Lord. We praise you, Lord, for being with us. You said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you have your way tonight as we come together and break the bread of life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Glory. I'll tell you what, I'm fired up today. God is good, and He is able to do more than what we could ever ask or think. Last week, we started with chapter 1 of Acts, and tonight we're going into chapter, uh, well, we did part of chapter 2 last week, but we're going to continue in chapter 2 tonight, and we're going to be sharing some things out of the Word of God. And it's exciting. Now, if you remember the background, the disciples had gone into an upper room, and there were about 120 men and women up there, and they prayed for many days, and they were waiting for the promise of the Father to come. Jesus had said, you go there, you're going to receive the promise of the Father, and you will be given power to be a witness in Jerusalem and Samaria and throughout all of the ends of the earth. Wow, what a promise they had. And as they were in that room in one accord, that means they had unity. It's wonderful when we see unity, how good and pleasant it is for unity to be in the church. It's like oil, says in the scriptures on Aaron's beard, when he was anointed like anointing oil. They were in one accord in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came, he showed up, he came in flames of fire, and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues, and everything changed. It was a big, big day for the church. Now we're going to learn that there was a church in the Old Testament. They looked unto the day of Jesus coming, whereas we look back to the day when he came. But we're all looking forward to the day when he comes again. And they went out of the room and they started speaking and people that were there for Pentecost from all over the world. They were there and they heard them speaking in their languages. But they knew that these men were unlearned. That they did not learn these languages on their own. They had received power on high. But when this happened, Many, many people thought they were drunk because they were so filled up with the Holy Spirit. And then we come to verse 14 and 9. 13 says they mocked. They said these men were full of new wine, which means they thought they were drunk. And when you're filled up with the Holy Spirit, sometimes you're so giddy you act like you're drunk. But there's no high like the Most High. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> no high like the Most High. Verse 14. <clears throat> but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Jerusalem, excuse me, you men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken, or listen to my words. In other words, Peter, the one that had denied Jesus Christ three times, is now standing up. He's full of power. He's full of God. And now he's standing up to tell them what's going on. He said, listen up. Listen to what I have to say. He said, for these are not drunken, as you suppose. 
Seeing it's but the third hour of the day, which means nine o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He's trying to tell them that this was an answer, a prophetic word that was expected. Wow. Now, we're going to read what he has to say. In verse 17, he's quoting Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 32. It says in 17, quoting Joel, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now, first of all, he's saying in the last days. Now, that's interesting because this was written about 2,000 years ago. But the last days is talking about the day of the church, the day of the fullness of God on the church. He said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. How much flesh? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, that means to foretell things of the future. Some people use that incorrectly and use the word prophesying for preaching. And if that's the case, then the sons and the daughters can preach, including this lady that you're listening to tonight. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. But that's not what it says. It says prophesying. That means foretelling the future. That means to give an account of what God has shown someone and speaking it forth. And then it says, your young man shall see visions, and your old man shall dream dreams. What's interesting, in Joel chapter 2, 28 to 32, let's turn there. Joel chapter 28, 32 to 34. It is going to tell us a little bit about the same scripture. And let's read verses 28 so I can read it out of what the Old Testament has to say. It says in verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Now when you go back into verse 17 of Acts, it says your daughters shall prophesy, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So it's a little bit turned there, but I'm going to say the old men can see visions and have dreams, and the young men can have visions and see and have dreams. Amen? Amen? And not only them, women do too. And then he goes on in verse 18 of Acts, and on my servants and my handmaidens, that's women, and that means everybody else. I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And if you notice there, the word spirit is capitalized. That means Holy Spirit. Not just any spirit, but the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is God. God is the Holy Spirit. And they shall prophesy. It says, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Wow! Those are quite some signs. And if you think about what's been going on at the time that we're in right now, we've just seen many blood moons come past. And they happen on Jewish feast days. So these are signs to Israel. These are signs to the world that something's happening right now. God is trying to get our attention on these days that we're living in, people. We are living in the last of the last days. But the Spirit of God's been poured out ever since the book of Acts happened. It said, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord comes. Now I want to point out to you, the word there, Lord, means Jehovah. Wow. Before the notable day of the Lord comes. So we're speaking of Jehovah there. And we're, as we go down, you're going to find out that Jehovah stands for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three together make Jehovah. And you're going to see that in the Word. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? Whosoever means you. Whosoever means me. That means whosoever 
shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now back into Joel again, it says, let's read from verse 28 in chapter 2 of Joel. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. How much flesh? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And I tell you what, right now there's pillars of smoke and there's fires going on right now all over our country. And in Israel there's been fires. These are all signs that were in the last of the last days. 31 in Act in Joel 3, excuse me, Joel 2, says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now that could be many, many different things. It could mean earthquakes that are so, so major all over the world that the ash actually shuts the sun out. I know when Mount St. Helens erupted, that whole area didn't see sun for quite a while because the ash was in the air and that can happen. But it also could mean something else could happen to the sun. 32 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, remember the word is Jehovah there for the word Lord. Now, let's look at verse 22. You men of Israel, back into Acts chapter 2, verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words of Jesus of Nazareth. All right, let's turn to Romans 10, and let's read that. Romans 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 10. Now, we have just read, Who shall... And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, let's read what the Word of God has to say there. And we will start in verse 8. Romans 10, verse 8. What saith it? The Word is nigh thee, that means near thee, even in thy mouth. That means your speaking organ right here. And in your heart, which means your spirit. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be saved. Now, in our spirit is where we believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And we feel it and hear it and we believe it in our inner man. But we have to confess it with our mouth too. You can believe in your heart and never confess with your mouth and you will not be saved. It says you must believe in your... It says with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, when somebody that I share Christ with gets in a position where they've asked Jesus to be their Savior, I always ask them to call somebody they know that's a Christian and tell them about it right away. We don't want to put it off because Satan will try to steal everything from us immediately. So it's important that we confess it to others. How about you? Have you shared with anybody that you know Jesus as your Savior? If you have, say Amen. Amen. Glory. I'm glad to hear that. Now back to chapter 2 of 8. Chapter 2. In verse 21. That's what we just read. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that word Lord there, again, is the word for God. Who shall who calls upon God shall be saved. Then he goes on. Now remember, Peter is standing up, talking about what had happened in the upper room talking about their coming out of the upper room with the power of God on them, that they were witnessing and sharing in languages they had never learned. 
And he goes on to say, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. In other words, he's telling them, listen up. There's something important that I want to share with you. He says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now see, Jesus was the lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So God knew in the foreknowledge of what was going to happen. God had planned this. This was no accident. Jesus didn't come and then just make up his mind he was going to do this. This was the plan of God from the foundation of the world. He made a plan from the very beginning that there would be a way out for each one of us. Aren't you glad for that? It wasn't some happen chance thing. It says, by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. In other words, he's letting them know what they had done. They were responsible for the crucifixion. But it had to happen. It had to happen. He had to die. He had to go into hell. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, put his blood on the altar. This had to happen. So we shouldn't be sad that it happened. We should be glad. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. We should be glad. It says in verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So he was raised up by the Father. Then later it says he raised himself up. So God in the three persons raised himself up from the dead. Yes, he died. Yes, he rose again. Praise the Lord, he rose again. We don't serve some dumb, dead idol. We serve a living God that God allowed this to happen to. Now it says here, for David speaketh concerning him. And this comes from Psalm 16, which we're going to go to. It says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's on my right hand that I should not be moved. Now the word Lord there is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S. That is a Greek word that means supreme authority. Now when we go into the Old Testament, into Psalm 16, let's turn there. I want you to understand who Jesus is. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a man. He's not just someone that was crucified. He is God in the flesh that was crucified. Psalm 16, 8 through 11 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he's on my right hand. And he's speaking of Jesus, but the word Lord in the Old Testament is Jehovah, which is the Almighty God, the Supreme One. Jesus is Jehovah. Father is Jehovah. Holy Spirit is Jehovah. Is Jehovah. The three together make up Jehovah. It says, because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now you remember when Jesus ascended to heaven, it says he sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That doesn't mean he sits on his hand. He sits on the right side of God the Father Almighty. It says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. And if you notice, that's the same rendering, the same reading back in Acts. Then it goes on, Because thou will not leave my soul in hell. And in, in Psalm chapter 16, it says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. The same exact thing is in Acts. This is a prophecy in the book of Psalms that was fulfilled in the New Testament in Jesus Christ. You see, everything that was prophesied about him has come to pass. There's still a few things that will happen in his return. And my goodness, I don't think that's that far off. Then it also says, Thou hast made, in verse 28 of Acts 2, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Wow! In 
Back in Psalm 16, it says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Who is at the right hand of God the Father? Jesus Christ is. Praise the Lord. Then he goes on to speak. He has a lot to say that day. And I tell you what, after Jesus was crucified, these same disciples went and hid because they were afraid. They're not afraid anymore because the power of the Holy Spirit had come on them. And now he's bold enough to stand up and he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. See, David didn't rise from the dead. God was speaking in Psalm 16 about Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. It says, Therefore, being a prophet, yes, Jesus was a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ and sit on the throne. David, King David, was a prophet. And God swore to him that out of his loins, one would come to set up the kingdom. One would come to sit on his throne. And he wasn't speaking about himself. There was someone that would come down through his loins, through his seed. And Jesus Christ is a direct descendant of King David. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah? Yes. It says here in 31, He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. See, Jesus didn't have any broken bones. When they pierced his side with that sword, blood and water came out. They knew he was dead, but he had no broken bones. He had the nail piercings when he went into the grave, and he had the nail piercings when he came out. And we're going to go into a verse right now. I want to take you to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you recall, he appears in an upper room to his disciples, and there was one that wasn't there with him, and that was Thomas. Some of us are like Thomas. We want to see things, and we want to know about them, and we won't believe it unless we see it. And let's start with verse 19 of John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. In other words, he still had the nail piercings in his hands, he had the piercing in his side from where the sword had been, and he had the nail piercing in the feet. Now let's see what he says in verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. See, the Father and Jesus are not the same person. The Father sent Jesus back after he was risen from the dead to see them. It says, My Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's when they were saved, right then and there, right in that upper room. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. When you receive the Holy Ghost into your life, you are born again. Your spirit man is dead until the Holy Spirit comes in and quickens it and makes you alive. That's when the disciples were saved. And he goes on to say, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. That means forgive. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The word Didymus means twin. He was a twin. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I won't believe. He was one of those kind. 
And some of you may have been that type too. Unless I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Well, there's no faith in that, my friends. You have to believe without seeing in order to have faith. <laughs> then he goes on. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. He said, No, I have to see it myself. But eight days later, let me see, let's see what happens. After eight days again, in verse 26, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And saith he to Thomas, Reach hither my, thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. He knew what Thomas had said. See, God knows everything. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He knows it all, people. He's omnipotent also. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. What did he call him? My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The disciples have believed on his name, and breathed on him, and they received. Just like Adam was breathed on in the original in Genesis, when God breathed into him and became a living soul. He had the Spirit of God. And of course, when he said sin, he was still alive physical, but the Spirit of God had departed. So that's when the disciples were saved. And it's important you understand that as we continue back in the book of Acts. Because you have to take the whole picture together in order to understand what's about to happen. Now it says right here, David, it says, verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. In other words, God raised up, that word is Theos in verse 32. Theos, that's supreme God, Theos. God, the Father, raised him up whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he shed forth this which you now see and hear. Now, do you remember in the book of Acts, in the very beginning, let's go back to chapter 1, Jesus said to them in verse 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now this is interesting because he breathed on them and they received the Holy Ghost. That power was in them but not on them. There is a difference and you're going to see what the difference is shortly. The disciples had already been breathed on and received the Holy Ghost. Now there are some borderline cults that teach that this was just a prophetic word to go to Jerusalem. But Jesus said to them, Receive the Holy Ghost when he breathed on them. There's no doubt in my mind that right then is when they received the Holy Ghost. You can take scripture out of context if you want, but I'm going to take it in context and I'm going to put it the way the God of my heart taught me to do this. So he says in 33, Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Jesus had told the disciples that out of their belly would flow rivers of living water. In order to have the rivers of living water in, they have to be put in first. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you. Now we're going to see what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. And the word in the New Testament there for Lord is Kyrios. But in the Old Testament, the word is Jehovah. And David was speaking about Jesus to come, the Christ. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, 
whom you have crucified, both Lord, and that word is Theos, and Christ. Now Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. That's what Christ means. And when you're a Christian or a Christian, that means we have the anointing on us that was on Jesus Christ. His anointing comes on us and we become disciples of the anointed one Christ. Now, when they, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. In other words, they were beginning to understand what they had done. Have you ever sinned? Yes. And when the Holy Spirit comes and gives you a little nudge, you're pricked in your heart like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Well, that's what this is speaking of. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They recognize the fact that Jesus was who he said he was, that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he was crucified, he was dead, he was buried, and they had something to do with it. And he's, they said, what are we supposed to do about this? This isn't something we should have done. And then Peter said unto them, repent. All right, that's the beginning. When you repent, that means you confess your sin. That means you make the decision to turn away from your sin. That means you make a change in your spirit, your soul, and your body. You repent in your mind, your will, and your emotions. You make the decision that you're going to take a new direction. You're not going that way anymore. You're going to go forward with God. So that was the first thing they were to do is repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's talk about this baptism. If you recall what Jesus had to say and what John the Baptist had to say, I want you to picture this. Here's John the Baptist. He comes on the scene. He's the forerunner. He's the one that was preparing the way for the Christ, for the anointed one with his anointing. He was Jesus' cousin. He was a few months older than Jesus. But he came crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the, of the Lord. He said, repent. And when John came on the scene, let's see what happened. And we are going to go into the book of Matthew. Let's go back in here. And we will go into Matthew chapter 3. This was the message of the prophet John. John was a prophet that came on the scene. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent you, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. This was a baptism of repentance. This is they didn't get saved there. They just were repenting. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O oh, generation of vipers, and who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. In other words, do things that are suitable for repentance. Don't just come here in your long robes and think you're all right. You need, you're a bunch of whited sepulchers. You look real good on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead man's bones. And he said, And think not unto yourselves, we have Abraham our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these sons to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I, 
Acts, this is the key, indeed, baptize you with water under repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, John's preached a message of baptismal repentance. But Peter says to them, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Not John's baptism, but the baptism that Jesus is speaking of. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we will read verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bound or free, and have been made, have been made, have been all made to drink into one Spirit. What is he talking about? What does the word baptism mean? It means to immerse, to be totally immersed. The baptism of repentance, you're immersed in water. But this says we're baptized into one body. When we are saved, it says the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. That's what this verse is talking about. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about being baptized or immersed or placed into the body of Christ. That's the only way you can be saved. Because the Father can't look on you outside of being in Christ. He cannot look on sin. But Jesus, he that knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what is he talking about there? He said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, our sins are washed away and we're placed into his body or baptized into his body. Then it says, when that happens, then you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When you're saved, the Holy Ghost comes into you. But now they could receive what Peter and the disciples had received on that day. It says, for the promise, speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which has the evidence of tongues that the disciples have received, says, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward or crooked generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. That means that they were saved, they repented, and they were placed into the body of Christ. And it says, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then verse 32 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And what does doctrine mean? It sounds like a real complicated word. It just means teaching. They'd been with Jesus, so now they are teaching these people and discipling what Jesus had to say. Remember, the disciples received the Holy Ghost in the upper room when Jesus breathed on them, but they received the power or the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and that gave them the power to witness, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Those people received it, they repented, and they were baptized or placed in the body of Christ. It does not say they were put into water. Now I'm going to take you to another verse here. Let me see which verse. Go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, before we continue on. And in Acts chapter 18, we will start with verse 24. And when you get there, I want to hear a big amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody there? Excuse me. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an elegant man, 
means he was smart, a learned man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, that means he was zealous for things of God, he spoke and taught diligently things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. What was that baptism? Baptism of repentance. So what was he teaching and preaching? He was teaching they needed to repent. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Achilla and Priscilla, that's a man and woman, had heard, they took unto them and expounded or spoke unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass in the cave, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much what had believed through grace. What did they teach? They taught that. It wasn't just repentance, that the, he needed to receive the salvation of Jesus Christ that comes by grace. It says, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Now, there's a lot of different churches that teach you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. And that's the only way you can get the Holy Ghost. But that is not what this is talking about in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 tells us we need to be baptized into the body of Christ. That's how we are saved. We are placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. After that, we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit comes in when we're saved in the body of Christ, and then He comes out in honest with the fullness of the Spirit. In verse 28 of chapter 18 of Acts, it says, For He mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus is Christ, or the Anointed One, and the Anointing. See, Achilla and Priscilla showed them a more excellent way, the way of Jesus Christ. All he knew about was repenting. And that's an important thing to do is repent. There's nothing wrong with that. But the baptism into the body of Christ. Remember John said he must decrease that Christ would increase. He said that he baptized with water. But there would one come after him that would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Praise the Lord. Now back to chapter 2 of Acts verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. The benefits of participation in the local church are immediately apparent. Let's look at it. They studied doctrine and fellowship, breaking the bread and in prayers. This passage records the first meaning of the first local church. From this passage, seven benefits of participation in the local church are immediately apparent. First, they're instructed. How many of you listening were really instructed in the ways of the Lord? So many people go to church and they never learn anything. They don't know who they are. They don't even really know who Jesus is. And they probably don't even know what their church believes. But here it says in these verses, let's read the rest of 42 through 47. They instruct in breaking bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And who were the apostles? They were the apostles of the Lamb. They were, I like the little song, Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Then came Philip Thomas too, Matthew and Bartholomew, James the one they called the less, Simon, also Thaddeus, twelfth apostle Judas made, Jesus was by him betrayed. Now the twelve they're talking about included the eleven plus Matthias. He was one that came in and was voted in after Judas had committed suicide. So, they, the apostles of the Lamb, these are the ones that were with Jesus, that had walked with him, talked with him, and had been instructed by him in person. There's a difference between apostles in the church and the apostles of the Lamb. It says, and they all believed were together and they had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And the body of Christ should be helping each other out. We should be helping. If one has a need and somebody else has a way to do it, I tell you what, we could end welfare awfully quick. 
We wouldn't need Obamacare or anything else like that. We wouldn't need health care. We'd have the ones that have the gift of miracles, the gift of healings, and there would be the body of Christ rising up and doing what God told them to do. Then it goes on to say, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. When he got saved, they were placed into the body of Christ, baptized into the body of Christ. Now these, there's these seven things, first of all, there's instruction, which included breaking the bread. The breaking the bread was having Holy Communion together. They had that. Then they also had corporate prayer. They were taught how to pray, how to have effective outreach. They were taught how to go out of their house and do things. Then it says, fear came upon every soul. They had common goods. The church was alive and it was vibrant because Jesus empowered the church with his Holy Spirit. He parted every man gifts, which we'll <coughs> learn about later in the book of Acts. And they were singleness of heart. Wow, they came together as men. The church has gotten off track so badly. And what is it going to take? For the church to come back together again, I tell you. And they were told to leave Jerusalem, they didn't. And great persecution came on the church. And they were scattered then throughout the world. Is that what it's going to take? Is persecution, destruction, judgment? I believe we're at the door of that right now, folks. And the reason we're studying the book of Acts is so that you can understand the power of God in your life. That you can rise up and be the man and the woman that God has called you to do. I'm thankful that you've been with us tonight. Next week we're going to go into chapter 3. But maybe there's somebody out there listening that's never received Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you've heard about Him. Maybe you go to church. But you've never surrendered your life. Maybe you've never been pricked in your spirit. But tonight through hearing these words, you're pricked in your spirit. And you want to make a decision for God. Maybe there's somebody listening tonight that was saved when they were very young, but you've walked away from God. God's calling you home. He's calling you back unto Himself. He loves you with an everlasting love. The Word of God says He draws us with cords of love. I would say to you tonight, get your heart right with God. He's calling you to come home. Pray with me, please. Let's say this prayer of repentance. Father God, Father God, I have sinned, and I've sinned against you only. I deserve to be separated from you in hell forever. But I thank you, Father, that you sent Jesus to die for my sin. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to wash me with your blood. Come into my life. Make me new. Let me be all that I need to be. I give you my mind, my body, my spirit. Everything I have is yours. Do with it what you would please. In your name, Jesus, we ask you. Amen. Amen. Now, if you've done that, you've received Jesus as your Lord. I would like to hear from you. And if you've enjoyed this video tonight, please share it with somebody so we can get the word out. God bless you. Until next week, have a great day.